Eric Sykes searches for a girl named Alice, but finds her jealous husband instead. Sunday at 5.30 on Channel 6, Toronto. Saltzman, and this is the day it is. Warren Davis is off cruising the country somewhere on another assignment, so I'm left holding the fort all alone. I'll get to the weather later on in the program, but first I want you to meet a man who has fascinated me for a very long time and who I was finally able to meet here and talk with for this program not too long ago. He's Warren Sturgis McCullough, age 70, an American, a confirmed eccentric, a genuine Renaissance man. Listen to these professional qualifications. Psychologist, psychiatrist, neurophysiologist, doctor, neurosurgeon, philosopher, teacher, poet, engineer, mathematician, and lots more, and an expert in every one of these. His permanent job at the moment is head of the Department of Cybernetics of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. McCullough is a genuine character. For example, he usually travels around the world in a cloak and hobnailed boots. He is reputed to live on ice cream and whiskey, has 17 adopted children, never goes to bed before 4 a.m., and can usually confound any expert in any field. He is an advisor to the U.S. government on space matters and is one of the fathers of the modern computer. Recently, he wrote a book, Embodiments of Mind, which is full of fascinating material representative of the scope of the man's mind himself. Well, enough of the background. Let's get down to the man himself. This is how he answered my query about what makes a successful scientific discoverer. Well, generally, that he makes enough wrong guesses and climbs out of them. The art is always to be willing to make the guess, to be willing to be wrong, to be completely humble to the fact, and to be completely haughty to man. What do you mean by that? Why haughty to man? No, otherwise you get laughed out of a right idea. Yeah. That happened to me when I was 14 years old. At that time, my father said to me, live always as if you were a great man. If you're not, you'll find it out. Why haughty? I found it out. What was the incident provoked that comment by your father? Oh. At the age of 14, I'd invented a tetrahedral carbon atom. First man to do so? At 14? I don't know. Maybe others did and got laughed out of it. Uh -huh. But I was 14 years old. I've never been laughed out of anything since then. You mean your theory was right that there is... Oh, it turns out it was right. But I didn't know that for, oh, six years. Somebody else everybody had, had it. <laughs> you, as one of the world, if not the world's foremost brain expert, an MDS I am not the world's first expert, nor the last. One of them, if I may say so, I may say so, uh, as an MD, a doctor, and a psychiatrist, and a psychologist, and a philosopher, right. and a poet. Why did you, after all of that, turn to engineering and become an engineer? What is that, what's the relevance of that to humanitarian goals? Oh, very simply, in the first place, I wanted to find out what was going in the brain. Mm -hmm. I'm using that in the old sense. Clark Maxwell had one question always. What is the goal of it? And when you answered him, then he asked me, what's the particular goal? Now, if you're going to find these things out, you've got to get in there, and you've got to make measurements. So you've got to have at your disposal the physical tools necessary. Okay? Mm -hmm. An engineer is a man who has to deliver the goods. And that's what I wanted my instruments to do. So I had to learn how to make my measurements. Do you think that there, that there is such a thing as an elitism of brains? I'm sorry, yes. But people have special qualities that set them apart from others? They certainly do. No two of us are alike. I am thoroughly convinced that some of us are endowed with certain things long before we are born, at the time we conceive. Others of us just don't have it. There'd be absolutely no chance of my being a good musician. What part does training play in here? One would assume that you'd be a better musician with training than one oh, than without. I don't know. I can keep time. But as far as carrying a tune is concerned, heaven help me. So a person you say then is uh, hobbled or crippled uh, even prior to birth? Hobbled or crippled or endowed. Uh -huh. Long before we're born. Now you have a high IQ. No, I do not. I have a happy, 
normal sort of an IQ, about 140. Well, how come then you've achieved uh, all the things you have? Uh, great eminence in your chosen fields, hundreds of scientific papers, known around the I world? I suppose because I'm so neurotic, I can't go to sleep of a night because ideas trouble me. They just stay with me and they bother me. Okay? What do you mean neurotic? You mean nervous? I am sick? Nah. I mean, in my nervous system, something is going on which won't let me sleep till I get a problem solved. It wakes me up. But this must be the mark of genius. Most people don't have that sort of thing unless they're worried about some practical problem in life, let's say. Hung up? Are you hung up? No. I'm hung up on theoretical problems. Uh -huh. I'd love to know the theory of knots. It took me 40 years to learn to count a pine cone. I haven't taken but I never let go of those things. They just keep churning. And they turn in my sleep. They churn while I'm waking. Do you do your best work while you're asleep? Very often. Very often I wake up with an answer. It may be wrong, but I wake up with an answer. Why is it then that people who might have a higher IQ than Warren McCullough haven't achieved what Warren McCullough has done? Just because you are able to think in your sleep? No, just because I'm so hot and bothered about problems that I just keep on thinking about them. Other people, I suppose, lose interest, quit, uh, stop worrying, because my brain goes right on worrying about these things. It always has. That's the perspiration part of inspiration, is it, that you're referring to? Yes. Uh, would you advocate a world ruled by scientists then, by the super brains? No. Why not? No, scientists are absolutely unfit to be rulers. Scientists are not interested in controlling other people. They're interested in finding out how the world really works. Now, look, I'm not even able to run a gang of 20 people, and I've had 50 at under me. No, no. To run the world, no. No scientist is fit for that. We are fit for discovering how the world works. We're not fit for telling other people what to do. Remember Bertrand Russell's description of work? There are two kinds. One is moving matter from point to point. The other is telling other people to do it. Hmm. Now, a scientist is fit to move matter from point to point. Find out how it works. But he's not fit to tell other people how to do it. Does this mean scientists should not engage in politics? They may, as other than scientists, as ordinary responsible citizens, sure. But not as scientists. That certainly is not the business of science. The atomic scientists have uh, swung a fair amount of weight in the uh, councils of the world, and particularly your country, the United States, mm. right? I'm sorry. Every time they do, they do it wrong. Dr. McCullough, do you think that the human, the human being would have a brain if he weren't able to speak? That there is such a thing as a celebration without the power of speech? Yes. Yeah. I'm quite sure of it. You did an experiment with me in which uh, I had to hold my tongue and uh, That's right. try to think by counting, and yet it, and it turned out I couldn't do so, at least not as well as not one That's uh -huh. right. So go back Again further. and again, one uses his motoric apparatus, using his brain to put these parts in motion. Some people think chiefly with their tongue, some think very largely with their fingers. Many mathematicians, if you watch them, are doing this with their fingers. Is the reverse true, too, that the right way to teach children is to allow them to move? Oh, yes. No question. You mean sit still in class is a very bad instruction? <coughs> right. <coughs> well, and I think most of our mass media have this curse. You put up a picture, and the fellow's glued to the picture, and there he sits looking at the picture. He can't do a blessed thing about it. So what would you advocate? Read Very little gets in. Yeah, but you read a book, you're glued to a picture, it's on, in print on a page. Yeah, well, that's a clumsy way of getting things across. We do it, but it's clumsy. After all, even then we have our eye movements. So what's a better way to teach youngsters? Oh, it depends on the age. You start out with a beginning. The main thing is to keep mobile. A child is moving around and moving things with his hands. He's forming ideas. He learns to read faster, he learns to write faster, he learns arithmetic faster, you name it. This goes back to the peripatetic school where the early philosophers talked and argued while walking. It was there, where the uh, uh, subconscious. Being myself a peripatetic, 
Yeah, you get around quite a bit. <laughs> no, I mean it. I stand at my desk to write. And between sentences, I walk up and down. Is there a big difference between the brain of a woman as an average and a man as an average? Well, there ought to be. Difference. There ought to be. Because there's a difference in body volume, body surface, and so on. So the woman's brain, since she's smaller than a man, should be smaller than a man's brain. Well, does this mean her intelligence is uh, less? Not a bit. We all belong to the crazy group of creatures which took off from the mainstream of evol evolution way back and grew brains in excess. But we're all overbrained creatures. Hmm? And the evolution will carry on to the point where we'll be all head and no tail? The land of Tom Toddy, all head and no body, yes. That's where we're heading, and we're doing it badly. Why do, why do you say badly? How could we do it better? Uh, a little more reasonable use of our brains. Our brains are put into our bodies to see to it. We get fed, get some exercise, we get our children. And we should die and get out of the way by the time we're 40. And we go on to ages like mine, 70. Where you you got holes in your head, all through it, where cells have died. You mean literally holes in your head? Sure. Places where there used to be neurons, but there aren't any anymore. How many holes have you got in your head? Oh, I suppose somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the cells that I had in my brain are dead and gone. How, how, just a little scar there. How fast are you losing your marbles then? At my age, oh, 100,000 neurons a day. 100,000 cells in your brain are dying per day? Yeah, something like that. It sounds incredible. How many have you got to start with? Well, the old figure used to be 10 to the 10th. 10 to the 10th? 10 to the 12th. That's an awfully big That's number. a large number. Hmm? We oh. didn't count the little ones in the old days. So how come people like, say, Bernard Shaw, Da Vinci, or numbers of others were bright in the, until their 90s? They, they couldn't well, have, why not? They couldn't have lost... Uh, oh, yes, they'd lost. When do you start losing? At the age of about 16, you can begin to see the holes in the place where the easiest to count. No way to arrest this? Not that I know of. Well, does this mean then that when 16 years... Remember, when one dies, you never get another one to replace it. The That's the difference between neurons and every other cell in your body. They're never replaced. Brain matter never regenerates. Well, uh, uh, it may make a new connection through if the destruction doesn't leave a scar in the way. Mostly it does. Does this mean that the person is at the height of his mental powers at the age of 16 before the brain cells start to mm, die? Yes, about that. Dr. McCullough, to improve our mental health, where do you think the, uh, the most favorable path lies in the, in the oh, chemical? In the chemistry of the, of the system. N not in the psychic uh, approaches, eh? That's secondary. Most of the disorders of the mind are inherited difficulties in the metabolism of the brain. It just doesn't work right chemically. And you there are over 100 diseases now known, which we know are metabolic, Difficulty. The metabolism of the brain is not right. And can you intervene and correct that? Some of the times we can now. Not always. Certainly not as often as we will be able to. You mean all the disorders of the mind, such as ranging from feeble-mindedness and idiocy and retarded children, right up to schizophrenia and epilepsy, and every kind of disorder that originates in the mind is really a physical disorder? Oh, sure. It's not psychic, it's not socially induced? It's not oh, it could be socially induced. Yes. For heaven's sake, if you take a Mack truck and try to race it, you're going to burn up the engine. Mm -hmm. If you're a flivver, you better not try to haul the load of a Mack truck. Sure, you can abuse any machine, this one included. I have no doubt about that. You said psychiatry is a refuge of the incompetence. Do you still believe that? 95% of the psychiatrists in the United States come out of the lowest third of the class in medical school. I said nine out of ten. The Rockefeller records were 95 out of every hundred. But you were a psychiatrist. Oh, yes. Yeah. I sure am. And yet you're knocking the profession. No. I'm knocking the professionals. <laughs> Do you think it would be possible to cure civility? Civility? Yeah. 
Once the cell is dead and gone, you're not going to grow a new one. You mean it's never going to be possible to stave off death? Oh, that could be. But who wants to end up a grasshopper? I don't want to live forever. Why not? If you could keep your faculties? Oh. That you can't do. I couldn't even keep my teeth. <laughs> you think we'll make a machine to equal the brain, the human mind? As far as arithmetic is concerned, they're already way ahead of us. I mean in general, memory, idea formation, a soul, so to speak. You know, when first the machines came out, everybody thought that they wouldn't, that they would, that they didn't fact. I'm sorry, let's leave the soul out. All right. Well, do you think that the computer will approximate the human mind in all our respects? Computing machines think with a language which is number. Everything else we transfer into number to make them work. Okay? They are lousy when it comes to perception. They don't have any underlying natural language the way we do, that we share with the animals. But when you want to make them spot objects, develop a model of the world around them, you find out they're not the right device. Okay? If you want them to play chess, all right. Our chess playing program at MIT is already a number two chess player. In another year, I think it'll be a number one. It will not be a master at the end of another year. But it's six years old. Hmm. But in six years, it's all from nothing. It's come up to being a number one. No human being ever did that. So I expect them to go well ahead on these kind of problems because we can reduce these things to number. Hmm? Mm -hmm. But they'll never be able to write a piece of poetry like Warren McCullough can. Why not? Can't produce poetry the number, I would assume. They can produce very nice music. I see no reason why. If we learn enough about our own mother tongue to let them go right, but they can't do it. At the present time, as far as languages are concerned, we can handle the languages which are produced for programming. Those are languages in which the context does not matter. Everything is right there in that sentence. They are phrase-structured grammars. All right? Now, these can be completely understood in terms of group theory, whereas human language, natural human languages, cannot. What would you say is your legacy, the legacy of your work? Oh, that's very easy. It's the youngsters who work with me. Mm. Easy. It's the youngsters who work with me. Mm. I've had 120 younger, more than 120, younger collaborators. Forty of these are very good scientists in their own right today. In Holland alone, there are seven of them who have their professorships. In Holland alone. So it's not your papers and your books and uh, the works by which you'll be known, eh? It's the people you leave behind you. It's the youngsters. This is the way you stave off death. No, no, I don't stave off death. I'll be happy to die problem. tomorrow. You can face death with equanimity? Always. I've never worried about death. That can happen any moment. I mean, if you actually knew the date, the moment of your death, you could still go on... I wouldn't do anything any differently. Not even sooner? No. no. I'm going to get back in time to pay my income tax. Warren McCullough, he has an aneurysm, a bubble on a basic aorta. At any moment, he can go. Didn't want me to ask him about it on air. I was trying to hit at it at the end there to see whether he'd open up, but you heard what he said. Embodiments of mind, the quality of his mind. What about, well, he's a key figure who stands at the intersection of many fields of specialization. Here's a bit of his poetry. After the storm upon the beach, an oar, worn in the leather, broken in the blade, are these. Yesterday, Christ thought for me in the morning, Nietzsche in the afternoon. Today, their appointments are at the same hour. Tomorrow, I shall think for myself all day long. That is why I am rubbing my hands. He's very anti-Freud, you know. And the BBC did a five-day-long interview with him uh, on film for television at his own place in Connecticut. And he suspects they stayed with him that long because they wanted to trap him on film while swimming in the news with his family, a habit he has. They never did, though. He's so well known the way he dresses and looks, he travels around the whole world as he does constantly. The customs officers let him through instantly, knowing how to do, Dr. McCullough, so on. Uh, this book, by the way, is a difficult one to read. 
One, a couple of the chapter headings, where is fancy bread, why was the mind in the head? Those are the easier parts to read. Finally, an inscription to a friend of his in this city who put us on to him, which reads, we fight not for possession, not for power, not even for honor, but for that one thing in the world which no one who is good gives up, except with his life, his liberty. Warren Sturgis McCullough. Into the weather. Uh, on, first of all, we're going to have a great weekend, a change from the heat wave and into nice, dry, refreshingly fresh air from the west, and I'll show you in a moment. But I wanted to show you on this map of the world the average hurricane tracks and belts around the world. The equator is the dotted line here, 